Tonight, if you're willing, if you allow me for the next uh, couple hours as we have together, I'm just kidding. Uh, we won't be here till midnight, I promise you. The Ravens done played, right? And they won. Um, so you're good. Yeah. So by the end of tonight, you should be cheering twice as loud because you cheered that loud for the Ravens. Come on, we should be like going to another level tonight. We're going to have revival up in here. Um, but what I want to do tonight is I want to just unpack some stuff that's been in my heart, some things I've been sharing at our church to our people that the Lord's been downloading. And if I offend you, I love you. But the word of God is offensive. And when people follow Jesus, he a lot of times spoke some things that people didn't want to hear. But the reason he spoke it is because he loved them enough that truth, truth demands, like, like when, when you love someone, I want to speak truth to them, right? If I love my wife, I'm not just going to keep tickling her ears. I'm going to share some things to her because I love her. You with me? Because I want to grow with her. I want to be in a deeper place with her. If I just share everything she wants to, to hear and she says, how do I look? Oh, you look great, you know? And, and, and it's like, there's a point as a husband, I cheer my wife on, but then there's a point where I'm honest with her and truthful because that's what God, God's word does. It digs to the deep things of our heart. So tonight we're going to go deep. We're going we're gonna to get into some stuff. I'm going to share some things. And like I said, I want you to hear it from a young man who really cares about you. I love you. And I want 2024 to not be a new year you know the slogan, a new year, a new me? I want you to grow in God more than anything else. I want your relationship with God to be the foundation. Amen? All right, so let's pray, and then let's dive in um, tonight. Do you love Jesus? Come on, I know you do, because you're here tonight. So I believe you've come to receive from God, not from me. So come on, will you just steady your heart tonight? Lord, we love you. Thank you for your word. God, your, Lord, your word is living and active, and it's sharper than a double-edged sword. God, now this is my prayer. Would you give us a heart to hear what it is your word is speaking. God, give us, put literally as Solomon said, when, he, when God asked him, what do you want? Solomon said, give me wisdom. Literally, if you study that out, he was saying, Lord, put ears on my heart that I can know what to do. Lord, that's what we want to be. We want to be people who have ears on our heart, hearing from you tonight, not hearing from me. So Lord, open the ears of our heart to hear you tonight. Let us be able to receive what it is you have for us. And we love you in Jesus' mighty name. And all God's people say, amen. amen. Turn to your neighbor and say, neighbor, amen. you awake? Amen. And if they didn't respond, give them a little tap on the cheek and wake them up. If you got a water bottle, sprinkle a little water on them. If they wake up, say it's holy water. Amen. Matthew 25, if you got your Bibles. I don't have the uh, big screen working tonight. I just figured... We would dance around because sometimes the Lord, as I'm getting ready to preach something, sometimes the Lord will veer me somewhere else. So I try to be obedient to the assignment, but also be flexible to what the Spirit's speaking in the moment as well. Um, Matthew 25, if you got your Bibles, we're going to start in verse 1. I got a lot of scripture tonight. Um, so just buckle up your seatbelt and, and, and let's get this thing in the, in the lane God wants to go tonight. Matthew 25, starting in verse 1. This is a very, very popular parable. You probably have heard of it. And we're going to start here and we'll see how the Lord leads tonight. This is Jesus speaking. Red letters. So listen up. Verse 25, verse 1. This is Jesus saying, then the kingdom. Someone say the kingdom. Amen. The kingdom. Then the kingdom of heaven shall be likened to ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Now five, someone say five, Five of them were wise. Any wise people in the house tonight? I think we got a bunch of wise people in the house. And five of them were foolish. Is there, no, I won't go there. Um, no fools, just all wise people in the house tonight. Five of them were wise. Five of them were foolish. Verse 3. Those who were foolish took their lamps and took no, no oil with them. Verse 4. But the wise, someone say the wise. The wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. But, when the, but while the bridegroom was delayed, they all slumbered and slept. At midnight, someone say midnight. Come on, we're heading towards midnight, aren't we? We're getting to the midnight hour. Come on, if some of you guys are like me, you won't make it past 11 o'clock, right? Come on, midnight ain't got nothing on you. 11 o'clock is where it's at. That's where we'll be seeing the back of our eyelids. I used to be able to do it, but not anymore. Um, at midnight, a cry was heard. Behold, the bridegroom is coming. Go out and meet him. This should be a joyful time. 
Then all the virgins arose and trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said to the wise, Give us some of your oil. Our lamps are going out. But the wise answered and said, No, least there should be not enough for us too. But go rather to those who sell and buy for yourself. While they went out to buy, the bridegroom came, and those who were ready went out with him to the wedding, and the door was shut. Afterwards, someone say afterwards. Afterwards, the Lord, afterwards, the other virgins came also saying, Lord, Lord, open up to us. But he said, surely I say to you, I don't know you. Watch therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour in which the Son of Man is coming. Do you believe Jesus is coming back? Come on. Do we still believe that anymore? God's coming back. I think sometimes we can focus in so much on the here and now, we forget there's a king returning. There's a king coming back. Come on, when he comes back, he's going to establish his kingdom. You may not like the way things are now, that's okay. You may not feel, feel so enthusiastic about the way the world is right now, but don't forget, you're not of this kingdom. You're not of this realm. You may live here. You may have a home here and a car and, and, and you know, some nice things, but, but don't get caught up in that. You're not of this kingdom. There, there, there's, there, there's, a, there's a bridegroom coming for his very own. And that's you and I as believers. We're his own. A bride is coming, sorry, a bridegroom is coming back for his bride. You and I are called the bride of Christ. We're the bride of Christ. So in this parable we have ten virgins. You've heard the parable before, so I don't want to, if, if you haven't, I'll just try to narrow this in. We have ten virgins. Five were wise. They brought extra oil for their lamps. Their lamps were burning. They were to keep those lamps burning in, in anticipation for the bridegroom to come. That was, that was how it was supposed to be. So five of them had extra oil ready for the whole night. So if he didn't show up at 10, they, their oil was still running. If he didn't show up at 11, they still had oil. If it was midnight, which the story says that midnight is when the bridegroom came, they were still rolling. But what happened was the other five just had enough oil to get through, just had enough oil to, to make it to the place where they said, well, if he's delayed a little bit, we'll have enough. But what happened is the bridegroom was delayed, so both the fools and the wise fell asleep. So when the bridegroom came, he woke them all up. Hey, he's here! And they're all trimming their lamps, getting it ready, and they go out to meet the bridegroom. But what happens is five of them had extra, five of them didn't. So they had to go out and get extra while the other five got to enjoy the bridegroom. And when they came back, someone say it was too late. It was too late. One of the things the Lord was showing me in this passage over the past couple weeks is I've been just praying this through as a church. And I get the privilege of being able to speak at other churches across um, across the area in, in, in Maryland and even outside of Maryland, we, we get to travel a little bit and preach at churches is I see a common denominator. I'm not saying this is you, so don't get offended if you're like, why, why are you saying this? I'm not saying this is you. I'm just saying this is what I've noticed is there's a lot of people in the body of Christ that are getting into the slumber stage. They're getting a little heavy eyed and sleepy. There's a bride, there's a bridegroom coming but though he may seem a little delayed, their eyes are getting a little heavy. They're getting a little overwhelmed by the, 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 the cares of this world and the, and the things going on in life. That they're, they're getting a little slumbered to, to what they should be wide awake to. And if you're not careful, you'll find yourself in a sleeping state. Not alert. Not watching out. Because there's an enemy looking to take you out. And if you're not careful and you're caught sleeping, let me tell you what, you're a prime target for him. I was reading, there's a funny story. I mean, it's not quite funny if this was you, but I thought it was pretty funny. There was a, there was a guy who owned a house in Florida. He locked up his house for the night, which he thought he locked it up. He went upstairs to his bedroom and he went to bed. At 4 a.m. in the morning, it's a true story. At 4 a.m. in the morning, he woke up to the smell of breakfast being cooked. And he said, that's odd. I'm the only one that lives here. But I smell breakfast being cooked in my own house. So he walks down the stairs to see a burglar cooking breakfast in his home. While he was asleep, someone broke in, get this, and was cooking breakfast in his home. Now, this is where the story gets funny, as I was reading. I get amused by stories like this. 
So the owner of the house goes up to the burglar and is like, this is weird, crazy. What are you doing in my house? To which the burglar responds to the homeowner, go back to sleep. <laughs> like it was just weird. It's just weird. But think about it. When you fall asleep, a lot can happen without your knowledge. This man fell asleep. Next thing you know, he wakes up because he smells breakfast being cooked. And a guy had come in, made himself at home, whipped out the bacon and the eggs, got a little sausage going, and he said, I'll make myself at home. What happens, and listen, I want you to hear me clearly, church. If you're not careful and you find yourself getting heavy-eyed in this hour, that's the greatest trap in which you can fall in. Be because you become so vulnerable to get buckled down to this life and forget there's a king coming. There's a king coming for his bride. That's you and I. We're his bride. We're the bride of Christ. We're to keep ourselves spotless and clean. But how can you stay spotless and clean if you're getting a little heavy-eyed? You're getting bunkered down here to this earth. See, all the bridegrooms fell asleep. And the bride, sorry, all the bride fell asleep and the bridegroom came and when he came, a big old shout, hey, I'm here. And they all trimmed their lamps. What is trimming their lamps? Well, when I was looking that up, basically what they were doing is they were obviously trimming the wick, but they were also getting their lamps beautified, ready for him. Because what they had been waiting for was finally here. It had arrived. See, what happens is we can get into a state of getting so comfortable here we forget, as Paul says, fixing our eyes, not on this life, but on what's to come. We get in fights and bickers and we get in conversations we have no business with. We're the body of Christ. Come on, I'm a part of a kingdom that won't be shaken. Anyone else? Come on, my king's coming and the Bible says when he sets up his throne, Come on, there's no dominion, no other power, no other authority that will overthrow him. You following me? So you should not walk with a, with a sense of slumbering like, oh God, are you still here? Are you still in control, Lord? I see all these things happening. I see all this, th this things compiling in our world. Lord, where are you? And, and really what God's saying is not where am I, but where are you? Are you slumbering? Are you sleeping? Or are you being watchful in this hour? A lot can happen when you fall asleep. And I truly believe God's trying to wake up his church for his return. When I was growing up in church, I was raised in church, born and raised in church pretty much all my life. I was a pastor's kid. We were in Michigan for a little bit. Um, I actually got to go back to the church where I was born at um, the beginning of November. Uh, I was in Brighton, Michigan, preaching at um, Pastor Brad Trash Church, who was here, um, and I took a little side trip about an hour over to Grand Ledge, where um, I was born in Lansing, Michigan, right outside of Grand Ledge, and went to the church where I was, uh, you know, born, and, and we were there before we came to Baltimore. And I was thinking about when I was sitting there in my truck about, you know, all the little times I was there, and I don't remember much because I was young at the time, but I was thinking how there was just a readiness my parents always had us in a place of not just being at that church, but understanding, come on, there would be moments where, I, I, you know, as a young kid, it's like we did these plays where, where it was heaven, gates, hells, flames, getting people to understand there is a real heaven, a real hell, there's an eternity coming, and there's a king coming. Are you ready to meet him? You're going to be shocked when he comes? Some of you guys are like, Lord, don't come now, I'm not ready. Well, my, my prayer tonight is by the end of tonight, you will be ready. So what I want to do tonight is I want to tie in something, and then I'm going to, I'm going to give you some stuff to really chew on as you leave here tonight. As I was reading through this passage of the, uh, the virgins with their oil, the Lord led me to another passage in Zechariah chapter 4. And I don't want to read the whole passage. There's a lot there. I want to just highlight some things, and then I want to take you to three things that I believe the Lord wants to do through you and I getting into this new year. Zechariah chapter 4 is an interesting portion of passage. Um, Zerubbabel is given a task to rebuild the temple. And that was a big task because the temple had pretty much been demolished. Someone say demolished. So if something is demolished and you're set to rebuild it, it's like, okay, maybe we can do it. But the problem was half of his people were in captivity and they were slowly coming back. So he didn't have much to work with. He had some people that were filtering in, 
And he was, a, he, he was like, okay, maybe this could work. The Lord wants us to rebuild it. But then he's thinking in his heart, but maybe this won't work. Maybe the Lord doesn't know what he's talking about. <laughs> so Zerubbabel, in chapter 4 uh, of Zechariah, an angel comes to him and basically awakes him up and says, look, look, do you see? And he shows him this vision of, of a golden lampstands and these things burning. And, and he shows him two olive trees, one on the right, one on the left. And in the olive trees, I want you to try to get this picture. There's two olive trees, one on the right, one on the left. And they're flowing into this lampstand. There's seven lampstands, um, like sitting right here, an olive tree here, an olive tree here. And he gets this vision and, and he's starting to be perplexed. Like, Lord, why are you showing me this vision? What, what's this vision for? And the word of the Lord said to this rebel in, in, in verse 6, he says, Not by not might, nor by power, but by my spirit. Someone say, by, by his spirit. By his spirit, says the Lord of hosts. And he goes on to say, Who are you, great mountain, before you're Zerubbabel? You shall become a plain and shall bring forth the capstone with shouts of grace, grace to it. So he shows him this picture of an olive tree and an olive tree. And then this golden lampstand, seven little things where, you know, you put your, your wax candles in and oil flowing to the lampstands. And Zerubbabel's like, why are you showing me this, God? I got to rebuild a temple. Like, why am I getting this random vision when I got a task? And God was showing Zerubbabel, Zerubbabel, because it's not going to be by your power. You're going to set out to do a task, but you got to remind yourself who's the one doing the work. See, your hands are going to be doing something, but don't forget who's empowering you to do those, that work. And so here's, here's how the Lord was really starting to download this to me is, is this. Is, so these olive trees are sitting here, and if you could see the picture, half the olive tree is kind of extending into heaven. The other half the olive tree is, is, is bending to earth, and then the oil's running and hitting those, lamp, those uh, lampstands. And it's, it's giving oil to the lamps to keep burning. Later on in the passage... Zerubbabel says, what are the lampstands? And he says, those are the, the, eyes of the, uh, the, the eyes of the Lord scanning to and from the earth. And he says, who are the lampstands? And he says, these are the two anointed ones, which were the two people, um, Zerubbabel and Joshua, who were in charge of leading the great task. And so why am I telling you this random story in Zechariah? Why does this have anything to do with where the Lord wants to take you in, in, in this next year and closing out a year? If... If you're not careful, you can find yourself asleep. But there's an antidote to that. And it's what you're being filled up with each and every day. What's filling. See, there's a fire that needs to be burning in you. A passion that God wants to stir in you. But it's not by you stirring yourself up. See, I can get you into this, this building. We could get worship flowing in such a way. We could get you stirred up. And you could get pumped up. But that's called emotion. And know what happens with emotion? It will fade. You'll leave here, and those emotions will poof. Why? Because you're going to go back to the same house where you live. You're going to go back to that same apartment. You with me? You're going to go back to the same work environment that you maybe just don't like going to. And you're like, what happened? I was in that church building. and Man, they had that worship pumping. See, when you live by emotion, those emotions fade. You're not meant to live on emotion. God created you. You're an emo you have emotions. Those are good things. But they're not to dictate your life. You following me? Some of you guys are living by emotion, not by God's spirit. So when the emotions are high and good, you're just joyful and jolly. But when those emotions are slamming down, it's like back away today from that person. <laughs> Their emotions are just too much today. You with me? God's not called you to live that way. So how do we get awake in this season? How do we keep our lamps burning? How do we, how do we be wise in this hour? Not fools, but wise. How do we, if you're a parent in this room, how do you keep your kids actively pursuing the heart of God in a world, in a, in a system that's trying to pull everything that's God out of them? How do you do it? Well, I want you to picture this. So the olive trees were these two anointed people, Joshua and Zerubbabel. They were set to rebuild the temple. The oil was flowing through these olive trees. I was looking at a picture online, and it captured it so well. The oil was flowing through the two anointed ones, into the, the, if you read in the chapter four, there was these pipes coming out of the olive trees hitting the lampstand. And let's, per, per se, this lampstand represents like the presence of God. So these anointed ones were being filled with something and it was being released through them. So you have these virgins getting oil, the oil's burning the lamp, and the lamps is what the bridegroom was expecting to be burning when he came back. 
You with me? Are you following me so far? I'm going to, we're, we're going somewhere with this, but I really want you to catch this. So, Zerubbabel's like, all right, Lord, I'm not the one doing the work. You are. It's not by my power, but it's by your might. And so, how, how do we do this? Because a lot of the church is doing it by their might. A lot of the church is dictating their, their, their success on what they can do. They get, they get emotionally hyped up in a service, but then they leave, and then it's all about their might, their success. It's all about their, their, their status. And it's not about God's spirit doing the work. It's not about him getting the, the glory. It's, it's more about us receiving emotional glory. We need it for ourselves. But God said, I'm not, I'm not coming back that you can get the glory. I'm coming back that you can be ready that he can get the glory. Amen? So Zerubbabel understood, and this is what God was trying to show him. If you're going to be up for the task I've called you to, see, many of you, God's going to call to big tasks in 2024. You're going to hear his voice in a way you never heard it. He's going to give you an assignment. But if you're not careful, you're going to get busy doing the assignment without God. It's going to be by your power, by your might. And what happens is when you start doing the assignment on your own, you get slumbery, not alert of what God's doing, and then the pressures and cares of life start to take a toll on you. And this is something the Lord's been teaching me through my 20s, even now into my 30s. And so the oil, when the oil was used in the Old Testament, it was to set something apart to make it. Someone say holy. Holy means set apart. The Bible says, well, well God said, be holy as I am holy. And most of us think, well, how can I be holy if God's holy? God's perfect. How? God's saying, be separate. Come out. You're not of this world. You're in it, but you're not of it. There should be something different about you than those living in the world. Don't get mad that people are living in the world are angry, upset, and bitter. That's the world. You with me? Come out from among them. You should look different. There should be an incense, a smell about you that's different than the people you're around. If you're becoming like everyone else you're around, then you're running off emotional hype in a service and you're not being influenced by the oil God wants to stir in your heart. You with me? There's an oil you need when you're in the world. There's an oil that needs to be fresh and renewed. These, these gatherings are important, but they're not important to stir, stir your emotions. God wants to stir something deeper. He wants to stir your heart. Anyone with me? So you have to be careful because if you're being stirred by your emotions, you're going to be influenced by the world, by its occupation. You're going to be influenced by whatever, Instagram or, or the latest fab, the latest thing. Because right now you can go on YouTube and find a much better preacher than I am. You can go on YouTube and, and find someone that's preaching what you want to hear. You with me? If you're not careful, you'll start to listen to everyone's voice and you'll not know his voice. You'll say, well, this pastor said this, and this is the new fad. This is the latest thing going around. And I hear that a lot as a pastor. It grieves my heart. So I'm like, you know, and you know more about other pastors and what they're saying than you know about what God's trying to speak to you. Are you following me? Yes. And if you run off emotions, you're just going to keep clicking YouTube, finding things that stir up your emotions, and not knowing the heart of God for your life. God doesn't want you to run on emotions. So God told Zerubbabel, Zerubbabel, you got to be careful because there's going to be mountains that get in the way. But I love it because God gave him the antidote. He said, but I'm going to tell that mountain, get up out of the way. So don't get distracted. Don't get hindered. Don't allow something to get in your way. Keep doing the work I've called you. Let the oil keep draining through you. Let it fill you because when that oil's doing what it's meant to do, it's going to produce something even greater in you. But if you don't let that oil flow, you're going to catch yourself sleeping, get a little slumbery. And next thing you know, you're going to find yourself getting involved in things and, and, and doing things you never thought you would do as a believer. Why? Because slumber produces a sleep. And a sleep produces an unawareness. And, a, and an unawareness even produces you get desensitized. You start allowing yourself to watch things you never thought you would watch. You with me? Like, like you start just... It's interesting because, you know, years ago, right, there was this boundary. I grew up in church where there was, you know, legalism. And, and yes, I, I get the thing of like, well, you shouldn't do this, you do that. But there was a wall that people understood like, we got to be careful. We're holy. We're a holy people. We're set apart. And what happens is each generation, if we're not past something, the standard starts to fall a little bit. 
And if you don't uphold that standard, then you're going to pass something to a new generation. And they're going to be like, well, where's the standard? We're supposed to be holy, the Bible says, but I don't see any holy living around here. I don't see a people with dripping oil. I see people falling asleep. So the next thing you know, they're trying to find their way. So I want to encourage you tonight. God's given you a responsibility to hold a standard, to be dripping oil, Zerubbabel and Joshua, or to be dripping something into those lampstands. And that lamp, those lampstands were the presence of God. What was so important about that? Because listen, people were doing the work for them. They were rebuilding the temple. And if they were properly dripping oil, the presence of God was being stirred up among the people and they were experiencing the presence of God to do the work they were called to do. Are you following me? So you properly receiving from God on your own, not just in a church building, but in your own quiet time with God, is going to affect others. The presence of God is powerful. Come on, I was sitting with, um, with a lady the other day, switching insurances. Sitting there with me, and she's helping me switch insurances with car and all, the, all that fun adult stuff, right? Amen. All the adult people say, Lord, help me, right? Thank God there'll be no car insurance in heaven, right? My chariot will be fully covered by the Holy Spirit. Amen. You hit my chariot, I'll go to the Holy Spirit. He'll give me a new one, all right? I got Holy Spirit coverage. So I'm sitting there with her, and as she's doing all the work, and I can just tell, you know, there's, there's things in her. And, you know, my job as a, as a believer isn't the point of finger, but I'm to be sensitive to the Spirit of God. And, and as God puts things in my heart, I'm just to share them. And, and I remember with her, like, she's, you know, the, the agent getting all things such way. And, and, and I'm just sitting there trying to encourage her, love on her. And next thing you know, she's pouring her heart out to me. In the middle of, of an insurance place. It's not church. But God loves her. And the oil I carry should be so thick and running that an agent trying to switch my insurance over says, you have an insurance that I need. And I said, I do. I have a great insurance. And it's not, it's not, it's not what you're giving me. I have an eternal insurance. And I want to pass that to you. See, your oil needs to be running. If you're falling asleep, you're going to just be sitting doing everyday life saying, Lord, get me out of here. Instead of understanding God's given you a big assignment. So are you being influenced by the world? Or are you being influenced by the Lord? Not by power nor by might, but by my spirit, says the Lord. Says the Lord. See, when, when God said that the seven lampstands were the eyes of the Lord, it brought me back to 2 Chronicles 69, where it says this. This was the Lord speaking to King Asa. He said, for the eyes of the Lord range to and throughout the earth, looking for those whose hearts are fully committed to him. He's looking for a heart fully dripping with oil that he can strengthen, that he can produce something out of you. God is looking for someone who's running with oil that he can strengthen. Where does the oil come from? How do, I, how do I get oil, pastor? Well, it doesn't come by you just generating it with your own wit, with your own strength. A lot of people try to generate. Come on, you can go to a church that has much better sound than this church or much better lighting, and they can tickle you and make you feel good. That doesn't mean they have the oil. Are you following me? you got, you got to guard the deposit God's put in your life. And I say this with fear and trembling because there is, there is a movement going on in our world, even in the church culture, that, that wants to entertain you. Instead of being filled with saying, Lord, we're here for you. You with me? You're not to be catered to. When you come here, he's the guest. Like, like, he's the prize. He's the bridegroom. You're the bride. You with me? This is just an add-on. All these extra things, they're good, they're nice, they're fun to have, but they're not the thing. He's the reward. You with me? He's the reward. So I'm going to give you three things tonight, briefly, to help you keep your oil running. I don't want you to be those five virgins that didn't have extra oil. And when the bridegroom came, they weren't ready. I want you to be like Zerubbabel and Joshua that stood before the people and said, God's given us a great assignment, but we're not going to be the ones doing it in our strength. We're going to drip oil from heaven, and through us, It's going to drip into those lampstands, and the presence of God is going to be so thick in the environments we walk around. People are going to, it's going to be so tangible. People are going to say, what is that on you? What is that about you? So I don't want you to get caught sleeping. I want you to build a supply of oil in your life. How do we do that? Number one, I'm going to run through these, so just keep up with me. Number one, listen to God. Someone say, listen. 
Most of today's church, they're saying, you know, is God speaking? Is God speaking? The question is not, is God speaking? The question is, are you listening? There's the, there's the logos, the written word of God. Then there's the rhema, the spoken word. God is speaking in our hour. Are you tuning in to what he's speaking? God's trying to say something to you. God's trying to say something to your family. God's trying to give you vision to lead in this hour. The church should not be on defense. We should be on offense, pressing into the places God's called us to. I don't care how dark things are. What matters most is how bright are you shining? If you think things are dark, maybe your oil's being turned down and you're getting into the slumber stage. But man, you get some oil burning, you'll change environments. God will put you in place and you'll start changing environments. What you need in this hour, if you're going to get some oil burning in your heart and in your life and dripping to others, it's going to first come, you need a word from God. You need to get in the written word of God, understanding and growing in God's physical word. There's people nowadays I talk to, they say, Pastor, we don't need the word of God anymore. You need this. It, it stirs and it nurtures your spiritual soul. You with me? You need the word of God. You need to come to church and be, 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 be growing in it, but then you need to be growing in it on your own time. God speaking, are you listening? Look at what John 10 says. This, this is Jesus talking. He said, and when he, he brings out the sheep, this is Jesus saying, when he brings out the sheep, he goes before them. So Jesus leads a sheep. If you're a Christian in the house tonight, you're a sheep. And, and the shepherd, which is Jesus, he leads the sheep. And watch this. They, he says this, that they follow him for they know his voice. But watch this. Verse 5 says this. Yet they will by no means follow a stranger, but will flee from him, for they do not know the voice of a stranger. So it doesn't mean other voices aren't speaking. They've tuned into the voice that matters. So in your life, if you're going to produce what God's called you to produce, other voices will try to speak into that. Come on, we got church culture nowadays. It says you got to do it like this. You got. I remember when we went out to plant the church that we have now in Baltimore City. Um, in order to to kind of proceed forward, they had us go to this church planting initiative. And I'm like an oddball. If you ever around me long, like I don't fit in many circles. And man, they're giving you like these these incentives to grow your church from zero to fifty, fifty to a hundred, a hundred to five hundred, five hundred to a thousand. I mean, they're giving you all this stuff, and they're slamming it. And I'm like, wow, this is a lot of information. Then they give you this big piece of paper, and you stick it on a wall, and they said, come up with your vision. And you see people writing, and they got their fifty to a thousand plan, and their next five years written out. And I'm just staring, and a guy comes up to me and says, what's going on, man? You got nothing on your paper. I said, man, I'm so confused. He said, why? I said, because you're just throwing a bunch of formulas out there that work for you. I said, you've never been to Baltimore City where God's calling me. You don't know the area. I said, I don't need your formula. I need to get a vision, a word from God for the area. And I remember he just kind of looked at me and said, good for you. And he kept walking. And it, the Lord like convicted me that day. Because I'm like, that's the, that's the body. We're so conduced to formulas and this is how it works and this is what you need to be doing. When you need to get a word from God, you need to know what he's speaking. Quit being influenced by other voices and opinions. When you die to yourself, you break free of those voices. Only his voice matters. Come on, do you know his voice tonight? When God called me into youth ministry, I wasn't really listening all that well. Thankful for a father who saw that over me and gave me a little push. And I said, all right. And I started to tune in to the voice that mattered. And God started to align godly men and women in my life to help me cultivate an ear to listen. Because other voices are going to speak. Come on. Do you have kids in school? Other voices are going to speak. As a parent, you better be the loudest voice in your kid's life. Come on, if Netflix is, I got, come on, we won't even go there. Come on, if, if their tablet's speaking louder than your voice, we got many voices speaking. Are you speaking loud enough from the word of God that's oil dripping that your kids want to hear your voice? Man, I heard something the other day from a kid. It blew me away. They were like, I don't listen to my parents because they have nothing good to say. It's like a kid can see that his parent has nothing good to say in that kid's life. When you're dripping with oil, your kids will see you have something good to say. 
and they'll want it. See, my kids should be more in love with our voices than any other voice in this life. Because they should know that their, their parents hear from God. You with me? The Bible shouldn't be a strange thing sitting around your house. They should know this word. Come on. Let it become something. Quit listening to other voices. God's sheep, they know his voice. And that, I pray this over my kids every night. I said, Lord, may Eva, may Zion, may they know your voice. And the voice of a stranger, Lord, they will not even give an ear to it. When someone comes up that's a stranger's voice, they'll poof, push that out of the way. Say, that's not his voice. Amen? Amen. So if you're going to start dripping oil, you need to learn to listen to God's voice. As you read his word, his voice will speak. The question is, are you listening? Number two, you need to delight in what he says. So not just listen, but delight. Someone say delight. You know what delight actually means? It means to give someone great pleasure and satisfaction. So when you hear from God, are you delighting in what he says, or are you growing offended and saying, ah, nah, God, I'll take the next word. Ah, God, I, uh, I don't like that one, swipe. Right? Because that's, that's our world. Like, like, we pick and choose what we want. God doesn't pick and choose with you. He gives you what he's called you, and he says, this is it. You've been created for this. Now go. Are you delighting in what God says? What is another thing for delighting? Are you, when God gives you your assignment, your calling in your life, whether you're a mom, a dad, whether you're, you're a school teacher at work, whether you're in ministry, full-time ministry, whatever your assignment is, are you delighting in that call? And allowing him to fill you every day. That you can flow the oil that God's intended to flow through. Like those trees. Dripping oil. That the presence of God starts to flow in such a way people see it. Or when God starts to speak to you, you just become deaf to it. Oh, I can't hear you today, God. I got other. Because God's voice will inconvenience you sometimes. It will inconvenience you. But I want to know. Because. A lot of times I've been in church culture, I hear people say, oh, these were the good times, these were the better times, right? But, but I want to tell you, these are the times we're in. So where's the Noahs of our generation? Getting a word from God, Noah, build an ark. All right, God, we're going to build an ark, family. And he obeyed. Where's the Abrahams? Abraham, I need you to get out from this country and go. Where am I going? Just go. All right, fam, pack it up. We're going. Where, Abraham? I don't know. He said go. What, did, what, what sets apart the men and women, the heroes of the faith, is they didn't just hear God's voice. They delighted in what he said. And they were counted as righteous, the Bible says. Your righteousness isn't just by hearing his word. It's delighting in what he says. It's being brought, you're brought great pleasure and satisfaction by what God's speaking to you. I'll never forget Lester Summerall, one of my great heroes, Lester Summerall was a mighty man of God, and he has many books out there, and, and you, can watch, you, know, you, can, you can watch some of his sermons. But he was a young man. God healed him of a deadly disease. He was dying on his bed. He said, God, if you heal me, I'll give my life back to you. So God miraculously healed him, got him up out of the bed, and he started preaching to farmers in the middle of the Great Depression. And you know what his offerings were? They weren't money. He said, if, you, if you're here and God's touched you, tomorrow bring a cow, bring a pig, bring something. And, and these farmers are bringing their cows and pigs, and that's what they're bringing for their offering. Because it was depression. Money didn't have any weight. And so Luster Sumrall started to see God move. And then God spoke to him and said, I want you to go over to China. Get on a boat, go to China, and you're going to meet a missionary. And from there, I'll give you your assignment. And Lester Sumrall says, who am I supposed to meet? God said, get on the boat and go. With $12 in his pocket. He got on a boat from America to China. And from there, he met a man named Howard Carter, who was a missionary in China, who then began to develop and push Lester Summerall into the man he would become. To then he built a great television ministry. Many of thousands, if not millions, were impacted and saved because of him hearing the voice and delighting and what God said. I'll just share a personal story, and then I'm going to give you point number three, and then we're going to take communion together, and the band's going to get ready to come back up. When I started youth pastoring here at this church, I didn't know a lick of what I was doing. I, I, was, I was on the computer researching how to, how to be a successful youth pastor. How, how do you do this thing? You know, Google, what do you do? 
how do you preach, right? Like, like just trying to, my, my dad, I'm like, hey, can I grab a sermon from you and I'll just re-preach it? And one day I'm in, I'm in the office and they put the youth pastors at this church in that corner office because if they get too crazy, they just kick them out on the Wise Avenue. That office goes right out on the Wise Avenue, you know what I'm saying? They just kick them right out the door and find another one. Um, and so I'm sitting there and I'm depressed. I'm, you know, so Pastor Bobby, who was before me, that youth group was growing. We had hundreds of kids coming. We had gangs outside. I mean, it was wild. It was crazy. It was awesome. Um, and then I, I take the mic and we go from 200 to 100 to 50 to 30. Every week, you know what my assignment was in that youth group? was to stack more rows of chairs and put them against the wall. And by like week number four, there's like three rows left. And I'm like, Lord, I'm the worst youth pastor ever. I thought you called me, but Lord, this ain't working out. So I'm in my office, I'm whining before the Lord. I'm saying, God, you got to find someone else. I don't think this church knows what hit them. I'm, I'm, I'm like depressed. I'm like, I'm stacking chairs. I'm looking at all the chairs that used to be filled with teenagers. Now they're all stacked up against the wall, getting dusty. We got two, three little rows of chairs. No one wants to come. All the gangs are outside fighting each other, beating each other up. You with me? It's like, I'm like, Lord. And this is what the Lord spoke to me. I was in my office one day. And it's when I started to really hear the voice of the Lord on my own. He said, Jared, what you're doing is not working. Try what I want you to do. Now I heard a word, but was I going to delight in what he said. So I said, all right, Lord, what I'm, not, what I'm doing is not working, so if that's your voice, tell me what to do. And I felt in my heart the Lord saying, rip up everything you were going to do this week. Anything, visitations, rip it all up. Pray and fast this week. And I said, all right, Lord. So I did it. I ripped up my notes. I ripped up everything. I closed my laptop, and I just prayed and fasted that week. I was one hungry man. I said, Lord, I'm starving. I'm hungry. And I just started reading my Bible, drinking water, and Lord... I need you in my office just worshiping, praying. I would start to walk this sanctuary, walk up in the balcony, just ministering because I was so hungry. I was like, I'll just keep walking so food's not even on my mind. You know what I'm saying? And Wednesday came, Wednesday night. And we, we had a normal service, just like we always had. I don't even remember the message I preached. It was such a dud that kids were running to get out of there. One girl came up the center aisle. Her name, her name was Lauren. She had a friend with her that night. Her name was Hannah, which I was shocked that she brought a friend. I was like, man, you brought a friend to this youth group? I don't even want to be at this youth group. I can't believe you brought a friend that wants to be here. You know what I'm saying? This place ain't the place to be. And her friend came up, Hannah, that night. And Hannah started to share her story that, you know, she has, she was, was you know, just a horrific past. Molested. I mean, thing after thing. Just this young girl. And she began, she was, it was, it was in, the, it was getting, it was still hot here in, in Baltimore, and she was wearing all long sleeves, so I'm thinking, that's just weird. You know, I'm sweating to death. All the kids are in shorts and t-shirts. What's wrong with her? And, and she begins to roll up her sleeves, and she showed me all these marks where she had cut herself. And she said, I'm a drastic cutter. She said, I've had so much pain in my life that the only way to relieve it is just a cut. And she would take razors every night in her bedroom, just cut her arms. She said when she ran out of places up her arm, she went to her chest and down her legs, she, she would go up her back and just night after night cut. She said, Pastor, I have scars all over me. And I said, Hannah, I don't have the right words to say, I said, but I know Jesus wants to encounter you. And I just began to lay my hands. I prayed for her, just a simple prayer. And that night she left. We wrapped up service. I went back to my office and closed out the night in prayer like I had been doing the past couple days. That night, or sorry, that next, one, that next Wednesday came around. I stayed praying and fasting. I threw out all my plans. Hannah came back. I said, Lord, it's revival. She came back. I said, we're going somewhere with this youth group. We're growing. We got one new person. She came running down, and this girl had a sparkle about her. But the one thing I noticed is she was in shorts and a T-shirt. I looked at her, and I said, something's different. And I was trying to think back, and I remembered some of the stories she shared. He said, Pastor, you'll never believe it. She said, that night after I went home, she said, I fell asleep. And while I was sleeping, I had a dream. Jesus showed up in my dream. And he said, Hannah, I'm a father to you that loves you, that died for you, that gave up his life for you. And she said, he took a sponge, started to wipe every scar I've ever had. And as he, as he wiped those scars, they began to get healed. Until all the places she ever cut were completely gone. 
She said she came up out of the dream and she looked and all the, all the scars were completely healed. She came back that next week and I said, Lord, I understand the assignment. Now I gave her the mic, said, share your testimony. And, and we started to see God begin to move. Because when I threw out my game plan, I got a word and I delighted in what he said. God said, now watch, I'll heal them. I know what they need. Forget the game plan. Let me become the plan. And God started to move in those young people. We started to see God do some wild things, and we got crazy in there. And God started to grow. The youth group, the youth group eventually grew, and people were coming, and outcasts, and people who weren't accepted, they were coming. Why? Because God was healing them. Not pastor and his message. God was doing the work. Are you willing to delight in what he says? Be obedient. Listen, someone in this room tonight, God's going to call you to something. Forget the game plan. Delight in what he says. Delight. Amen. Number three, this is my last point, worship team. If my, I don't know what my wife said. She's probably putting the uh, little one to bed. Um, this is my last one. Number three, seek to be like him. Someone say seek. Seek to be like him. You're made for his image, not, not other people's images. First John 2 says this. As you, the anoint, as you, the anointing you receive from him, remain in him. You do not need anyone to teach you, but as his anointing will teach you about all things. As the anointing is real, not counterfeit, just as he's taught you, remain in him. We have many people seeking to be taught by many others, but won't, won't let the Holy Spirit teach them. Won't listen, delight, and become what he says you are to become. We have a lot of itching ears people that need a word just to sustain them, when I'm like, God's, God's given you 66 books filled with words. And as you delight in this word, you'll start to tune your voice to his. Or sorry, you'll start to tune your ear to his voice. You'll seek to be like him. Listen, is it truly your heart's desire to be like Jesus? Come on. We, we got church services now that corral you in, corral you out, and it's like, what just happened? Are you seeking to be like him? As my dad said earlier, we pastor in a rough neighborhood. Many, many of you have been down there. Others of you probably just heard from others. It's rough. People get shot every week. We got people coming in, hanging on death's door. We got people coming in, and the next day I found out they're dead. Like, that's just the environment. And as we've set up, not my kingdom, his kingdom there, it began to change the environment to where the people doing the shooting would come to our church and say, you guys can't leave. Because you're here, something's different. I'm like, man, you're the one that could kill me. And you're telling me not to leave? Yes, sir. When you delight in what God says, he'll give you favor at your work, at your job. Hey, come on, if you, listen, if you come to our church on a Sunday, you'll see a group of, you know, a small church group of people, not all together, we're just there to meet with the Lord. But the one thing you'll see is this is my prayer. I want you to see hunger upon people. When you delight in what he says, you'll do anything. That's why Jesus said you got to count the cost. You don't just sign up on a sheet and follow Jesus. You're counting a cost. It's going to cost you something. It may cost you relationships. It may cost you friendships. Listen, I'm 33, and I look at other people that have walked with me and, and, and said, Pastor, I'll never leave you, and they're nowhere to be found now. Sometimes I'm sitting in my, my room all alone like, Lord, what have you called me to? And this is what I tune my ear in when the Lord speaks, but Jerry, am I enough? And I said, yeah. And sometimes the Lord will have to do this, and this is kind of a strange example, but this is the way the Lord gave it to me to end tonight as we get ready to take, because we're going to take communion in a moment. And this is the sacrifice the Lord died for you that you could be whole in Him. There's healing in this. There's wholeness for your body, for your emotions tonight. Some of you guys are running off emotions. You need to be healed in Jesus' name. Come on. Some of you guys are running off of stinking thinking and God wants to heal your mind tonight. And the way the Lord gave it to me is like, if I would call someone up here, and ask them, can you see the reflection of yourself in my eyes? You ever notice that? Like if the lights are right, if you get close enough to someone, you can literally see your reflection. And you ever notice that? Am I just, okay, thank you. A few people in here understand, all right. 
when you get close enough to Jesus, the Bible talks about like you being the apple of his eye. God wants you to get so close that you see who you really are in him. Are you following me? At, at, at a distance, you won't see rightly. You'll get a little cloudy, maybe even a little sleepy. But you start to get in a little closer to him. You'll see who you were called to be. I want you to live 2024, not for what other people say, not to, not to be the next big influencer on social media. I want you to live to be like him. Listen for his voice, delight in what he says, and seek to be like him. May that be your assignment this year. Let him pull you close. Love on Jesus. Strip that oil. If you're feeling a little weary tonight, there's oil for, for you tonight. Come on, he has maximum supply. What do you need? The Bible says, call on me. And I will, come on. God wants to show you things, give you visions and dreams. That's a lot of times the New Year's message. We want, God, Pastor, talk about dreaming and vision. You can't get a dream to it's a God dream. If it's a your dream, it's going to be by your power, by your mind. And if, did everyone get communion in here? If, if you didn't get one, just slip up your hand and someone's going to throw one at you so you can get one. I'm just kidding. We'll try to get you one if you need one. I think there's some perfect. If you, if you didn't get one, just keep your hand up. But here's what I want to do tonight is, anyone? Anyone? There you go. Take one there, brother. Nice catch. I want you to seek to be like Jesus. I want you to know what he says. Listen. In this hour, we need spirit-filled people. You can walk in power. You can lay your hands on the sick. They'll recover. Look, I had no special thing with Hannah. God had a meeting with her. I was just the vessel to flow some oil to her way so she could encounter his presence. And guess what his presence did? It changed her life. If you're hoarding God's presence for your own life, let God deal with you tonight. Let that oil so flow out of you. People start, come on, there's people with gifts in this room, talents. They need to be used for God. Being selfish in here if you're keeping it to yourself. So here's what I want to do tonight as we end with communion in your hand. You have the bread, which represents the body of Christ, and the juice, which represents the blood of Christ. If you're going to seek to be like Christ, you need to know who he is. The Bible says he was chastised and bruised for us that by his stripes were healed his body was broken that you could be made whole if there's healing that needs to happen in your body tonight both physically and emotionally let the lord do it tonight don't be stirred by what my wife sings don't let the music emotionally stir you be stirred by the spirit of god you with me let this learn to hear his voice tonight when you leave here and get home tonight i pray you don't remember the ball drop and i pray you get stirred by a word from god tonight amen so here's what I want you to do. I want you to take communion on your own. I don't want to necessarily lead you. I want you to learn to still to tune in to the frequency of God. Hear what he says. Delight in what he says. Seek to be like him. If you need something from God tonight, don't be hesitant. But let him be the priority, not what he can give you. Make him the focus. As we made him the focus, he started to change our neighborhood in southwest Baltimore. I saw people walking down um, alleys and they were getting healed um, with legs and different things. People would come in with infections and start to walk differently and be healed. Why? Because he's the one. I'm just delighting in him. He's doing the work. Amen. So my wife's going to lead us. I want you tonight in your seat to start off with the bread. That's the body of Christ. It's a symbol. And as you feel that, I want you to take that. I normally, I break the bread personally to remind myself he was broken and I can be made whole. And I want you to take that bread and say, Lord, any brokenness in my life, any wounds, any, any disappointments, any fear, any anxiety, any emotional trauma, any whatever, Lord, you were broken that I can be made whole. I want you to take that by faith over your life saying, Lord, I'm whole because you were broken. And the cup represents the blood if you need healing tonight, I want to tell you, there's healing in that blood. That blood is still effective today as it was 2,000 years ago, flowing from Calvary. If you need healing upon your body, if there's side effects from post things that are going on in your body, by, see, by faith is the key. Do you take it by faith? You just take a little cup and say, wow, that tasted pretty good. It's by faith. 
So I want you to take that communion elements as my wife leads us. And I believe the Spirit of God, the presence of God will minister to you before we leave here tonight. Say